Okay, so some internet stuff is being done today that may or may not mean it goes down temporarily while it gets improved or something. So let's make a video that's small in size and talk about Angel Loader some more. Okay, so you may notice this button here, which is the main menu, and then this button here, which is show or hide filter control. So I got a request to be able to show and hide this stuff if, in case you don't really use it. You can just, you know, any of these, you can just turn them right off. Any combination, you can show or hide them. So say you only really use title and author, you could just have title and author there, not a problem. And, uh, you know, that's pretty simple. <laughs> but, you know, hopefully useful. So let me just uh, put this to what I would want. That's basically what I would normally use most of the time. Now you notice there's no controls for uh, hiding these game buttons here, and it's the same thing if you've got tabs. Uh, you cannot, at the moment, hide these tabs. Now this is something I've actually been thinking about for quite a long time. The ability to hide tabs, and that's actually the rationale behind this use short names on game tabs thing, is to like make them take up as least space as possible, because maybe you've only got, you know, Thief 1 and 2, maybe you don't have SS2, maybe you don't have Thief 3, so then these would just be blank taking up space. And I've been thinking about making them hideable for quite a while. Um, and actually, showing and hiding these buttons is trivial. It's just as easy as showing and hiding these other ones. But tabs is more tricky, because you notice how you can show and hide these tabs? This is way more complicated than it looks, because with most controls that you put on the user interface, you can just call show and hide methods on them. Like you basically just call a function that says show this or hide this, or you can just set a visible property. It literally just shows and hides it, but you can still interact with it programmatically any way you want. It's just the visibility changes, so it's super easy, right? Tabs, you can't do that. You cannot tell tabs to show and hide. Nothing happens if you do. If you want these tabs to be visible, you have to add them physically into the tab collection. And if you want them to be invisible, you have to physically remove them from the tab collection. So this, when you show it, it's adding the tab physically. And when you hide it, it's removing it, but it's keeping it in a backing list. That's why you can say, show this tab. You can move it right there. Then you can hide it again. And then if you show it, it'll show up in the right place because it's keeping a backing list. And every time you move a tab, the backing list is also being updated with visibility and position, it's really super annoying. <laughs> so uh, I would have to do that with these game tabs here if I wanted them to be showing and hiding. Now, of course, I've got the system in here already, so I could just sort of paste it with a with some tweaks, perhaps, to here. But uh, another thing is, when you say that you've got, uh, I don't know, say you've got a finished state filter, say you've got this filter turned on, right? Well, and actually, let's just put them back in the list. So now you're only, yeah, you get this filter on. Now you're only showing finished FMs, right? So if you go and hide this filter, well, it's still activated. So if you want to, you know, deactivate all the filters, you've got to clear the filters. I don't know if I want to, I mean, I don't know. It seems when you hide a filter, should it just undo the filter? I'm not, may, probably, maybe, I'm not 100% sure. I'm still thinking about that. It seems maybe obtrusive, but then maybe, I guess, come to think of it, it might also make sense. But then it, maybe you're, like, weird and you want to turn on a filter, but then you just never want to see it again. I mean, that's pretty strange, but I don't like to take control away from a user. So so maybe just not messing with them when you hide them might be the thing. But anyways, the point is, if you do that with the game, like, say you've got an only Thief 2 filter, and then you hide the Thief 2 button, then you might wonder, well, why am I only Thief 2? Like, maybe you forgot or something. I don't know. You, you see what I mean, though? It, people might forget they have a filter enabled and have to remember that. I don't know. It's hard figuring out what people are going to find intuitive or not. But that's something that I could do to allow you to hide games that you don't have so you don't see, you know, Thief 3 or SS2 if you don't have those. That's something I'm, I'm considering. Okay, so I talked about this main menu, though, all right? So I, uh, you know how I was thinking last time, about, do I want a menu bar and how can I put, you know, tucked away options without taking a lot of space in the UI? And I got this suggestion from Dejen, why don't you just put a, a button just like this on the other side? And I'm like, yeah, why didn't I think of that? So currently I've just got a couple of, you know, options here. There's going to be more, but this is what I got so far. Game versions. Here's a game versions window. It simply just detects the version by reading the exe file or sneaky.dll in the case of sneaky upgrade. And it just returns the version and sticks in these text fields. And you can copy-paste them if you want. And just really simple, but if you want to know your versions, 
They're right here in this window. Nothing to it, but should be useful sometimes. And I got Global FM Stats. I'm still working on this. It's really not well presented right now. It's just like a bunch of text boxes with numbers that kind of numb your brain out. But this, I don't know, this doesn't seem useful all that much to me, but maybe once in a while and it's it's really easy to implement. So if I just tuck it away here, maybe it'll be okay. But I'm thinking of putting other stats, like maybe, you know, FMs that you've finished versus FMs you haven't. I mean, again, I don't know if people care about that, but I, I could do it easily. I could even make a fancy pie chart. Who knows? But, you know, the stats are here, and I know Dark Loader, like I said, does show, you know, how many quests you have available. So there is precedent for it, at least. And, uh, you know, this way it'll be out of people's face, and maybe I even have some shortcut keys for these. I don't know, but these are the two things I've got so far. Now, somebody asked me... Um, if I could have something like this, where if you start FM cell, you have the option. Wow, FM cell does not even obey the DPI level. You can't even read it at all. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, uh, so you won't be able to see this at all. I guess I'll zoom it in. You can say export FM.ne from FM, and it basically takes the info it's got about the FM, and it puts it into an FM.ne which you can stick anywhere. Um. One person asked if Angel Order could do this. I'm like, sure, I guess. So I started implementing it. I've got it here, but it doesn't actually do anything yet. But here's like sort of how the window would be. You can save the FM Dunny anywhere. But uh, trouble is, we actually don't have all of the data that FM Cell does necessarily. If you look here, we need the title, that's nice name. So yeah, like an FM.ne file has these fields. It has nice name, which is the title, release date, which is release date, info file that's selected, readme, tags is the tag string. Desker is the description. Now we don't actually store this in Angel Loader. I guess I should have, but I was, I guess at the time I was thinking we don't display this anywhere, so why scan it? You know how I said in the scanner video, the rest of the scanner, that it can scan the description, but it's turned off for Angel Loader because we don't use it? I should have left it turned on from the beginning, but it's not. I mean, I could flip it back on, but then people would have to rescan their whole FMs list just for the description. I don't know, but we don't have this info. So if we want to stick this in an FM.ne, we would have to get it explicitly when we go to export, which means we would have to see if there's an FM.ne file in the folder, and if so, we'd have to read it and read the description out of there. Or we'd have, if we're, we don't have a folder, we'd have to read it from the zip file, which is, again, not a big deal. But if, we're, if we have a 7-zip file and no folder, we'd have to extract it out the 7-zip file, which would mean a big, long wait. So that's sort of like a weird quirk that would have to happen. Um, one person asked for it. I don't even know how important this is. You know, FM Cell has even more features. I mean, it's got what? It's got, odd, no, it's got uh, create new FM.ne and batched export. Yeah, because batched export, uh, you... Yeah, I don't think you can select. Yeah, you can only select one fan mission at a time, but if you go batched export, then it actually just takes all the FMs in the list and just exports the UNE for all of them. And that actually kind of leads me into another thing that I have been thinking about for a while. And that is, what if we could allow multiple FMs to be selected at once? Well... That would require some reworking for sure, because there's a lot of code that assumes that only one will ever be selected at a time. But I'm thinking there could be some benefits, because, you know, say you want to say, well, I've finished... Wow, look at all this check marks. Say you want to say, well, I've finished, like, all of these, and you want to, like, you want to say, basically, uh, this, and you want to go, like, this, and you have to do them all just one at a time, and, I mean, I don't know how common this is, but <laughs> I found myself doing this <laughs> recently. So I'm like, you know, what if you could just select a bunch and then just hit this one time and it would apply to all of them? And uh, one person even asked if I could have, uh, you know, install a bunch of FMs at the same time kind of functionality. So, uh, so that's something I've been considering, and that batched FM export just reminded me of it. And uh, I haven't done it yet because it's a big change but it's something that's on my mind. Now, if we look over here in the Edit FM tab, we can see there's a disabled mod section. Now, this may not have been the best tab to put it. I might have, it might have been better to put it in here or something. But if we look at the Thief 2 folder and you look at uh, the cam mod.ne here, you can see there's this Uber mod path, multiplayer 
Uber Mod Path, and there's regular Mod Path and multiplayer Mod Path. So, as you can see, these are the paths for mods which are supposed to be loaded. So, the Uber Mod Path overrides the Active FM in the sort order. I don't know. Anyways, uh, so these are the mod paths that are set to be loaded, and you can see these are actually the names of folders with a plus in between them. So, if we look we can see that there is indeed a user mods folder. There's not a Necroage folder, but if there was, it would load it. Uh, there, There's no EP2 folder, but if there was, it would load it. There is a T2FMDML folder. So basically, if it can find any of these folders, it will load them. And even if there's uh, subfolders, you can see, like, if you wanted... Um, I don't think there's any in here, but if you wanted to have, like, you know, a subfolder in here, you could say, like, you know, DB mods or whatever. That would That would just load the subfolder. So... That's what is the deal with this uh, mod string. If you want to say, like, okay, normally uh, Necroage is enabled, but you wanted to disable it, well, then you would just go like this. And if you wanted to disable Necroage and EP2, then you would put a plus and you'd do that. This is pretty user-unfriendly, but I just did it this way at first because it works, and then I just kind of forgot about it. Disable all mods will just disable all of them. And that's the, actually the same as putting an asterisk there. That'll do the same thing. Now... The thing is, with NewDark, you can only explicitly disable mods. It's kind of an opt-out system. So you can't... You Basically, you pass this string. Like, if you want to say disable Necroage, when you run Thief 2, it will basically just pass this string to the game in the disabled mods field. This is the Angel Loader stub. This is what passes data to the game when it runs an FM, and this is just a structure with a bunch of data in it. So if you wanted to disable certain mods, you would pass that string in this field right here to the game, and then it would uh, it would just say, okay, if we see that mod here, we're just going to ignore it. But you can't pass an include mods string as the point. So if you, if you wanted to say... Uh, you know, Necroage should always be disabled except for a few FMs. You can't really say that, unfortunately. There's no way to do that. Which, you know, I just, it would be nice if I could do that. But the reason I'm telling you this is because I was thinking, okay, how about I make this more user-friendly? How about I move this out of the Edit tab and either into here or maybe into its own Mods tab? Or maybe I just rename this tab to Mods because really that's kind of what it's doing. I mean, this is for adding patches to the FM specifically. But, I mean, now that we've got... Uh, T1 FM DML and T2 FM DML, um, or whatever the thief one's called. The need for having specific patch files is reduced because most people will probably just have the set of them. And I guess, I mean, these aren't really mods, they're patches, but I should probably call this tab mods and then just stick the uh, this stuff into this tab. And then I was thinking instead of just having a text box with a string, I would have a list of the mods that both exist as a folder and that are specified somewhere in here. So that would be like mods that actually exist and are active. And then I would have just check boxes beside them where you could say, leave these enabled or uncheck them to disable them for this particular fan mission. Now that would mean I'd have to have some system for keeping this in sync because if this file happens to change, I would have to like update the list of mods that exist or if the folders change. Uh, in here, so maybe just like whenever you load an FM or whenever you click on this tab, it'll like reload the file or something. Should be pretty quick. But that way people could like actually understand how to use it, right? And if you want to disable, uh, you know, Necroage or something uh, for just this mission, you could easily just click it off there and you could understand it. Also, I think there should be more granularity here because when you click disable all mods, well, it's going to disable you know, the visual graphical mods like Necroage and EP2, but it's also going to disable T2 FMDML, which is really bad most of the time. Because if you've got a new mission and it's like, oh, please disable mods for this mission, and you click disable all mods and it disables the T2 FMDML, that's probably fine because new missions probably don't need the DML patches. But an old mission that depends on these DML patches, if you click disable all mods, it's going to disable them too. And that's... It's not just Angel Loader. Every loader that says disable all mods is going to have that problem, which is all of them. But that's something I've really been thinking about for a while. It's like there really should be an option to just disable all mods except patch mods, like except T2 FMDML. I'll have like a whitelist, so this one and then any other patch mods that happen. So like basically disable everything that 
that doesn't have to do with like having the FM run properly. So you could disable visual packs, but don't disable the, the patch pack. And that should definitely be an option. And of course, in order to have that, I would have to, you know, read all of the mods in here and just explicitly state each one of these in the string and explicitly not put that in. Because again, you can't just you can't just include. You can't just say disable everything except for a whitelist. You have to blacklist everything you don't want and pass that to the game, if that makes any sense. So it's a little trickier than it might seem, but that's something I'm wanting to do because it's just it's not really fair to ask users to understand what the hell this is and then understand why T2FMDML isn't working. And so, yeah, that's something that I want to do. Last thing, for a long time now, I've been thinking about making this work better on Linux. Apparently, a few people are able to run Angel Loader okay on Linux. I haven't actually been able to do that myself. I've tried it, and it doesn't work on the distros I've tried it on, or maybe it's my setup. I don't know, but Angel Loader is currently running on .NET Framework 4.7.2. And uh, if you know about .NET, the framework is kind of uh, in maintenance mode now. 4.8 is the latest version. There will ever be. They'll maintain that, but they won't add new features. Uh, the future of .NET is dot. Well, there's .NET Core 3 and 3.1, and that's like basically the next version up from Framework 4.8. But then in the future, they're going to drop the core. They're just going to call it .NET, and they're going to call it .NET 5, and it'll all be integrated. Because if you if you don't know about .NET well, this will all be confusing, but if you do, you know how there was like this horrible spread of like frameworks. There was .NET Framework, there was .NET Core, there was .NET Standard, which sounds like another framework, but actually it's just a standard, like, a, and it's, it's not a framework at all. It's just a laundry list, and it's just like awful. So they're integrating all of that into just one, .NET 5. And the first version of in the .NET 5 series is going to be coming out in November of this year, so we're almost to it right now. And if you try to run .NET Framework 4.7.2 on Wine, which is the Linux Windows running layer, um, it doesn't work so well. Some people have been able to get Angel Loader work, but even then I've had reports that it's a little bit buggy. But it's just, it's really difficult to do. So... By porting Angel Loader to .NET 5 when it comes out, that apparently works flawlessly on Wine, so I wouldn't even have to make an explicit Linux version of Angel Loader. I could literally just port this to 5.0, and people should be able to run it on Wine perfectly, one would hope. Now, I was going to port Angel Loader to .NET Core 3 when it came out, and I tried that, and I had some performance problems. And it makes me angry even just to talk about this because if you look around at .NET Core 3, all you will hear about is supposed performance. Performance is a feature, is a literal tagline that you will hear everywhere. They go, look how fast this is, look how fast this is, look at all these speed improvements we've made. And it's all a lie. It's all a lie, you guys, because I've measured Angel Loader and I've even measured other programs, I've even written programs explicitly for testing. I've tried everything possible. Framework versus Core. Core is between two and ten times slower for everything. I don't even know how Microsoft is getting away with this. It's so obviously false, you don't even need a profiler. You could just use your eyeballs. If you start Angel Loader, if you start it, this is the regular framework version, okay? It starts like this, reasonably fast. If you, if you simply just retarget this to .NET Core 3, it starts, like, literally 10 times slower. It's multiple seconds. Like, you can even see, this is probably, like, three quarters of a second or something. It is multiple seconds. You are hitting this key and you're just waiting. And the, the find FMs at the start, when, it, when I said that I, that was a thing that I improved the performance of with the hash table, that thing takes twice as long. Initializing the form, 10 times longer. No joke, actually 10 times frigging longer to initialize the form. Nobody on the web is talking about this. And I've measured... I've measured with every possible way. I've double and quadruple checked that I'm in release mode. I tried debug mode, and it's even slower, so I'm definitely in release mode. I've tried 32-bit and 64-bit. Same thing. I have tried... Uh, in fact, this I discovered this on my old computer. So it's not even my computer that's the problem. My old computer, my 3770K, that's as different as can be. It happened on there with Windows 7. It happens on here with Windows 10. I tried turning off the... Uh, the, the weird incremental jitting where it jits it crappily at first for startup time and then it re-jits it later. I've turned that off. It's even slower. Nothing I could possibly try would make it be faster 
or as fast as framework, and like I seem to be the only one who's noticed in the world. I don't even know how this is possible, but <sighs> now I'm kind of over dramatizing this. I mean, you don't really start the program and then wait and wait. I mean, it's, it's, I don't mean like you, you wait looking at, I mean, it's probably like two seconds to start instead of like three quarters of a second. To me, that's horrible because I'm like, this should never, I like performance and I hate how new software is always slower for no reason and everybody just glibly swallows it like they're happy about it. <laughs> so I hate that on principle. But is it really catastrophic? No, probably not. Like, you, people probably aren't going to notice anyways. I mean, well, I don't know. The four minute is just really bad. I don't know. It's, it's just infuriating. Not even really because it exists. Like, if they would have said that it was the case, if they were like, look, we made this new version of .NET. It's cross-platform. We couldn't, we couldn't make it the same speed. We're sorry. It's slower. I still wouldn't be happy, really, but at least I wouldn't be furious. But instead, they just lie through their teeth and say the exact opposite of the truth and claim it's faster when you use actual measurements to prove that it's not, or even just use your eyeballs. Terrible. But if I ported it to .NET 5, it would run on Linux, and people probably wouldn't notice the slowness because it probably would only show up if you have, like, 1,200 FMs or something, but, like, you might notice the window popping up slower. And, like, I don't know... People probably don't care that much. We're all used to software that takes 20 seconds to load anyway. So I wouldn't be worse than anybody. But I really just hate how I, in order to provide a better experience, I would have to provide a worse experience in terms of performance. I, I just hate doing that. Because I get angry when software gets slower for no reason. And I go, oh, these devs are incompetent. And now people are going to do that to me. But Anyways, I'm definitely over-dramatizing this speed hit. You don't notice it most of the time. I just don't like that it's there. So, <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll have to probably port Angel Odor at some point, and I just have to hope I can figure something out. Or maybe .NET 5 is, doesn't have the slowness problem of Core 3. I don't know. I haven't tried it because it's not out yet. But I don't have my hopes up. But maybe... Maybe if I switch to the freaking Maui interface next year when it comes out, maybe that will be faster to load. I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> that's some stuff that can happen. So uh, I think that's all I had to talk about. Uh, <laughs> hopefully this video is reasonably small. Anyways, uh, see you guys next time. Bye for now.